Yes, it was another huge weekend of hurling. Uh, big, big talking points all over the place. Uh, I'm Shane Stapleton. With me, as ever, is Michael Verney, and we're going to talk about all of those big uh, points. We're live on YouTube at the moment. Get your comments in and let us know what you think. There's an awful lot of... Uh, I think people think, reckon that the sky is falling in with hurling, Michael Verney. Uh, I'll just read out a couple of the comments that came in over the weekend, and as I said, get them in. The Michael Redden, I was wondering, was this a hurling match or an opera? Galway players diving around the pitch must be auditioning for Swan Lake. That was obviously the report on Limerick Galway. I've said it before, the rule book has ruined hurling. If this is a non-contact game, the GEA, uh, if, they want, if that's what they want, they succeeded. What a waste of time watching hurling when the referee is the main point of the chat. Probably the best teams in the country and the ref is the centre of attention. Sinead McLaughlin, Limerick's cynical fouling has been found out and the new rule is not suiting them. In any regard, it's only May and a lot of hurling to be played before any All-Ireland uh, is won. Michael Verney, has the sky come down? Hurling people aren't happy, Shane. I tell you what, and just even from reading out those comments, there's so many jests from each of those comments. Totally separate points almost that all warrant uh, debate. But I think the big thing is we have one of the great spectacles in the, in the world, one of the great sport and spectacles. Um, we are... It seems to me that we're doing our best to ruin it and change it when there's... I've known it needs to be fixed. If there's if something doesn't need to be fixed, there's no, you know, you don't need to go and change it. You don't need to find solutions. There's, we don't need to find solutions to problems that weren't there. I, I'll go back three years, less than three years, when we had, you know, I would say probably the best 24 hours nearly in the history of Harlan when we had Clare and Galway in that absolute extra time epic in Crow Park. Just a brilliant game. Peter Duggan's point, Johnny Johnny uh, Johnny Glynn's goal. Twenty four hours later, we had Limerick and Cork, another extra time epic. Uh, Nicky Quaid's flick, Keen Lynch's goal, and all the things. And now, all of a sudden, three years later, we're looking at you know a stop start game where the free takers are the centerpiece, and it's all it's every game is you know Jay Canning, fifteen thirteen frees, you know whoever it is, Jason Ford. 10 frees you know that's not what we want to see we want to see a free flowing spectacle and i'm glad i'm glad that it's as to the forefront as it is now because that's the only way uh, we will go back to what we had is for people to voice their concerns and for people to stop watching and for people to stop talking and if that's what they want if that's what the rule makers want they will slowly get their way and for years the likes of brian cody has said don't touch hurling leave it away don't take out the manliness but even listen to Jackie Tyrrell last night on the Sunday game, that seems to be what he's saying is happening here. And, and certainly all these comments here and John Kiley talking about simulation, like it's almost as if the rules are making it pay to do this. Now, um, just a couple of things. Uh, I'll just go through a few of the results in Division 1 firstly, and we'll, we'll go through the other tiers as we go along as well. Tipperary drew a Cork 22 points to 216. Watford had a three-point win over Westmead. Um, Galway beat uh, Limerick with a bit to spare by six points. Dublin saw off leash. Wexford, they came from behind to beat Clare. And Offaly had a thumping win over Kerry. Uh, brought to you by OrgaRetro.com. If you want to get this Cork jersey, that Mead jersey that Michael Verney is wearing, go to OrgaRetro.com, put in the promo code RGAME15% off. Um, Michael Verney, Alison Becker, the Liverpool goalkeeper got that last minute winner to keep Liverpool in the hunt for Champions League yesterday. Unbelievably dramatic. Unbelievable. And unfortunately, we'd usually be talking about hurling uh, in a very positive light on a Sunday evening. And this is how, how bad it was over the weekend is that as good as Becker's goal was, we're end up, most people end up talking about soccer on a Sunday evening, which is never, never, ever good. But it just kind of got me thinking, you know, I'm not saying it was a smash and grab, but what are the great, you know, hurling dramatics at the end of a game when a game was completely turned? Uh, and obviously, from a personal point of view, that the, the five minute final in '94 would probably spring out, but that just wasn't one goal. That was, you know, that was two six over over the course of seven or eight minutes. But that was one of the great kind of late flurries to win a game. Like, what stands out for you, any particular, like when you're talking about dramatics at the end of a game, a goal with the last puck of the, puck of the ball, like is there anything in particular that would stand out for you? Do you know what keeps coming to mind is Shane Maloney getting that point for Galway against Tipperary in 2015, the All-Ireland semi-final. And so I can't, that's obviously left an indelible link uh, or an indelible mark on me. Now, Corbett's last-minute point to beat Galway in 2010 is another one that sticks out where he wheeled around after the pass from Pal Burke. 
Uh, goals, off the top of my head, it's just those two. Obviously, Galway have left some sort of a, a link on me. Obviously, other counties have too. They're the ones that come to mind. So anyone else who can think of, what's the most dramatic last gasp goal, I suppose, or, or point that comes to mind for you? Uh, it's always a, an interesting one to talk about. Ones that people will always remember is, uh, you know, I'm always going to remember the Offaly one because I was on the right side of it. But you're all, like, aim and taff. I was just yeah. thinking, good, good and bad. Aim and taff, uh, 12 months apart. You know, you know, ecstasy and then absolute agony, uh, you know, a year later. Actually, the 2006 All-Ireland Under-21 final, was it Richie Power got a goal at the last second? Tipperary weren't fancied to win the All-Ireland Under-21 that year. And I think it was, they were ahead. I, was at, I remember being at it and, um, in Croke Park. And I think it was a last gasp goal from Richie Power that took it to a replay. <clears throat> and Kilkenny won the replay comfortably enough. But um, I remember that day as well. That was a real sickener. Just an interesting point, Shane, after coming in, just on the back of what we were saying there, Conor Lennon says, what was wrong with the game that the powers that be decided to change it? Some of the best games I've ever seen have been in the last three to four years, leave the game be. And that's so true. I uh, I, I genuinely think, um, and even within the media, people start getting on a high horse about different things, you know, just because there's there's cynical tackling in football and it's to me it's you know a good bit more evident to me it would have been in football and all of a sudden... People think that because there's you know some of that going on in Hurling, that Hurling needs to be the exact same. There are two games that are polar opposites. Mm. Like the scoring range in Hurling is you know just probably over a hundred yards. The scoring range in football is 45, 45 to fifty yards. They are completely different games played with a completely different skill sets at a completely different speed. You cannot referee the two games the same. You can't officiate the two games the same. You can't have the same rules for the two games. And another point on that is is that like last Saturday evening and it was it was a great picture because you saw you saw like the rock coming over to, to Tommy Dunn just before the match and the two boys almost putting the arm around the shoulder to both go carrying hurls for the evening because they can't stand on the sideline anymore as Mayor Farnet. And I was only thinking you know, one of the great sporting pictures. You know that picture of Kieran Kingston and The Rock has his arms on his shoulder and they're looking at, I think, a score happening or something like that, a big dramatic score. I think it was in the 18, uh, in the 2017 or 18 Munster final. And, like, we're not going to see that anymore. You're, not, you're denying Shannon all those great characters. McGrath. Do you remember that Dan Shannon and Derek McGraw? And it was the same thing as well. That Well, that was after the game, I suppose, where there was tears. But, like, you know, you want to see that. You want to see those interactions. It leads to the drama. You know, there are so many things sucking the drama out of hurling. Like the, the thing that makes it such a great sport, by the way, uh, when we talk about comparing it with football and rules and all that, football is an unbelievable game. And the less that they touch it, the better. Like it, when you have two good teams playing against each other in football and it's a close game, I think it's as dramatic as any sport out there. Obviously, like everyone has their own opinion on what's the most dramatic. But like when you come back to hurling, the one thing is you don't suck the air, you don't let the air out of the blue. The thing is, it's like a cauldron type atmosphere when you're in Semple, when you're in Crow Park, name the stadium that you love. And when things are going at 100 miles an hour, that's when things are at their best. When players don't have time to think, when they don't have time to breathe. But hurling at the moment, you have nothing but time to think and time to breathe. If it's not stops for uh, water breaks, it's for freeze, it's for, you know, whatever it might be. And uh, like at this stage, I think that the water break is getting a little bit farcical. Players the tactical do, break, the oh, tactical break with an absence of water. It's it's becoming quite the farce now. Watching, yeah. watching tactical boards being brought out, and like I, I'd ask you this question now. You know, I've I've been in dressing rooms where there are tactical board, tactics boards and stuff like that, and they're there at halftime and they're there before the match. And I actually think it's great as a player to get that feedback. So I'm really not slating any of the management teams for doing it. Like they want to do it, they need to get their message out. The players need to get the message and all that kind of stuff. But it's interrupting the flow. And instead of watching hurlers going out there and just let's see what they've got in their hearts when they go fighting for the ball and all that kind of stuff, instead it's, it almost feels like an ego trip watching it. That's unfair to the management. But that's what it feels like. You're like, oh, geez, can we get away from these lads over here trying to play chess and actually let the lads out there and try and knock their heads off each other, please? Accurate too, because they're literally moving, you're moving pieces around the board. Listen, I totally see... I totally see why they're doing it because it reinforces a point and people and players can get totally lost in a game and they you know they forget what they're supposed to be doing or whatever but it, it's only natural for a coach or a manager to take advantage of the scenario that's there in front of them so take the scenario away don't don't allow don't allow that to happen don't you know 
just have the 15 players. Don't allow the manager go near go near the players. It's a, it's a water break. It, that's what it's supposed to be. Um, surely, you know, the powers that be are seeing that it's no longer a water break. That's not what it's about anymore. Teams are getting in huddles. The manager or the coach is in the middle of the huddle. The tactics board is there as well. Like, I, I, I asked Paul Canurk about it, and he said, you know, obviously it got an awful lot of focus, you know, his tactic, tactics board being out or whatever. And he just said it was a reminder and it almost like a trigger with them. Uh, from a coach point of view, I'm sure they're delighted that they don't have to wait till half time when potentially there could be game changing moments after happening that they can actually go and have this at the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter, and then the game is over. But from you know, from a flow of the game, from the spontaneity of hurling, like we are eroding. You know, is hurling is hurling the fastest game on grass anymore? I think I think we're we're getting away from it. We're we're slowly getting away from it. How how often do you see the ball up and back like that? I mean up and back and still in play, not puck out shot wide, puck out shot point or whatever it is. Like we're we're we we're taking away what are the best points about the game. And don't even get me started. Like the slitter has to be addressed again. I don't care. We're we're scoring from too far out. It's ma- it's making the game too easy to you know just take a point from 100 yards like i put it to you this way and we'll get into it tipperary had no interest in pre- in in making any go at the cork goal the other night no interest whatsoever they had no interest in even going near the goal because they didn't need to and that's the way the game has changed that way where you actually don't need to score goals you don't even need to go at the, the opposition full back line a lot of the time and we're just gotten away we're going away from what has made the game brilliant and it's still a brilliant game and hopefully we won't be talking about this in you know three or four months time we're talking about the championship that this will just be oh remember that crazy league when they had all these stupid rules and they tried to ruin Hurling. And hopefully it'll just be, you know, an addendum to the end of the year and we won't be talking about it. But I'd be worried that we will be talking about it. Yeah, it is, it is frustrating to watch teams just shoot from 100 yards over and over. But, uh, like, there, what are the reasons that this is happening? Like, there is an evolution happening in Hurling whereby you're going to work the ball around. Like, Kilkenny were sitting people back from the puck out for years before anyone else seemed to cop it. I mean, the amount of times we saw Tipperary basically, you know, let, it's worth a few points in every game and obviously Tipperary kind of fell for it every single time for years and I'd have Kilkenny friends who'd be laughing at me about it but like other teams have been sitting back for the last couple of years on the puck out so if you're let's say Cork and you know a couple of other teams out there are you going to hit every puck out long when you realise you're outnumbered when a long ball is a defender's ball in the first place it's not even 50-50 like are you really going to go long time after time you can't, you'd be an idiot to keep doing it for years. So don't blame any team that goes short and decides, oh, we'll work this around the place. We've got Mark Coleman, we've got some other really tasty players who can work the ball out from the back, who can run up to midfield, 65, deliver the ball to somebody in space. They're doing the right thing. And Tipperary are doing the right thing from their point of view by trying to pressure them in different parts of the pitch rather than getting suckered up the field from the puck outs and allowing huge lanes for those pacey Cork defenders to run into from puck outs. Remember 2017, Conor Lahan went to absolute town against Tipperary. The three half forwards for Cork, they were crisscrossing across the field. The puck outs were put into grass. Conor Lahan was running onto them and he was off to the races. And like, look at Limerick. They hit long puck outs. Teams fall for the, or they hit a puck out. Teams fall for the, the movement in the middle. Maybe the three of them will go into a spine in the middle and then the puck out will bounce in front of the corner forward. So teams have to sit back for the puck outs. This is all part of the evolution of the game. Other teams will then work the ball short. And then there's going to be long shooting because you're not going to just hit it into, hit it into numbers. So we're just at this particular part of the journey in hurling whereby this is now the challenge. But I wouldn't be looking to rip up scripts. I'm not looking to... You know I don't necessarily want any rule changes from the last year or two. I don't like the penalty one. I don't like the black card one. Any of that kind of stuff. We're just at a particular uh, bus stop in the journey of hurling. And we should let things play out and see where it goes. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree with you. Yeah, it just, it, it's, it's the fact that we've actually, you know, that we're changing rules now to actually encourage guys to go to ground, encourage guys to look for freeze, encourage the guys to almost go against, you know, the not this you know, the sportsmanship of a game, but that's not what we want to see. And like uh the reason why the advantage rule was brought in is because uh you know the advantage of having a free is a score is a score of an opportunity. And you know, the the idea was that teams want the free, teams want that chance to score. But that's not 
that's that's thought goes totally against the game. It's just like every time you're going to be put, just putting your hands up in the air anytime anyone goes near you, or you're going to be going to ground, and you're encouraging guys to basically go against that free flowing nature of the game. And like I don't know, how, like I think we uh, thirty six frees yesterday in Limerick Galway. And it was just in no way a spectacle. And me and you will defend Hurlan and be as optimistic about Hurlan as we can ever be. And we could be previewing, uh, you know, the lowest of the low, a junior C Hurlan final, where there's going to be, you know, seven scores, seven or eight scores between them. And we'd still try and make, you know, uh, a silk purse out of a sow's ear. But, like, you, you have to call it as it is. The neutral punter looking at a game the other day, the, my mother is often the barometer for a lot of these things. If I ask her if she looked at a game and she said she looked at that one yesterday and she looked at the one Saturday evening, she said, ah, it's not the same as it was. So it's all freeze now. So that's, there's no entertainment in that. And that's the general that's the general opinion. You know what I mean? Nobody wants to see that anymore. You know, I just have no interest in that. No interest in watching free takers basically going out doing target practice in a, you know, a big league game or a big championship game. So... Uh, that that rule needs to be redressed first things first and to be honest with you that simbin rule it, to me is a total overreaction as well I I'd, I'd go with the penalty as a punishment and see how that works but listen I I don't know it's going to be interesting to see that the clamor maybe we need to maybe we need to talk maybe we need to be outraged in order for change to happen and hopefully it will yeah and get your comments in we'll try and I mean, I, I think people get a little bit sick into talking about rules and these, these particular points, but uh, you can't let them go either. But uh, we Just quickly, to... Shane, just a couple of interesting comments in. Martin Costello on, on YouTube agree about the size of the slitter. We should also look at the size of the boss of the hurl. They also have keepers uh, based with a huge sweet spot. Yeah, the quality of hurls now is much better than it was. The sweet spot is much better. You don't have to hit it on the money now. Strike at 120 yards. Uh, Martin Costello as well. I think this is a great one. Uh, we're talking about the Alison Becker moments. Last minute goal, 2004, Leinster final. Uh, he said Rory Jacob, but it was Mick Jacob. Yeah. Uh, blocked Peter Barry to score in the last second of the game. And Cody fell to his knees behind the goals. It doesn't get any more dramatic than that. Yeah, if anyone hasn't seen that, go and look it up. And just watch to the left-hand side of the goal as you watch it. Cody falling on his knees at the last second. It's, it's drama altogether. As a tip man, you absolutely love it. I'd give, come on, that's, that's for Wexford people. Let Wexford people enjoy it. I don't want to try and take that as my own. Um, but uh, we talked about like penalties and that rule, and there was a couple of interesting ones. Um, in the lead up to Lee Chin's goal, which very much turned that game against Clare, he was rugby tackled to the ground, but he was about probably 35, 40 yards out. Ball was hand passed on to David Dunn. Oh, sorry, I, this might have actually been the goal for Simon Donoghue. But anyway, he was kind of knocked down. He hand-passed the ball on. Yeah, he hand-passed it on to David Dunn, who did a stick pass across to uh, Simon Donoghue, and he knocked it into the net. But I wonder, would other referees have blown that straight away and said, look, we're not 100% sure if the goal is coming here? Now, there was, and it was good refereeing. But I just wonder, like, would others have spotted it, you know, instead would you have gone down the whole advantage rule and said, like... It's going to end up being a mess. And I, like then also, we're going to end up with simulation, because, which is something that John Kiley brought up over the weekend. Is Diven coming into Hurling? Has Diven been here for a good while anyway? But is it just more exaggerated now? And maybe John Kiley was just frustrated at the entire game because he was talking about, you know, what's happened with Hurling? We go away for four months, we come back, and this is what we're left with. Yeah, just a couple of points there you made. I thought it was interesting. Like, good refereeing has gone out of the game. You know, letting it flow. It, they have to, they basically, and they're being assessed. From the, actually, got a tweet before the match started. Great to see James Owens refereeing a match. You know exactly what you're going to get. But he will let it flow as much as he possibly can. But him and others are totally handcuffed now in what they, in what they can do. And uh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who you have in the middle of the pitch. They're, if they're refereeing to the rules that are in now, they're not, you know, referees' interpretation and these type of things are gone as with regards to a free or the advantage. You blow and it's a free. Um, I think, you know, there has potentially always been simulation or, you know, guys buying a free. It, it used to be cuteness now, but now it's just more exaggerated. Uh, guys are going to ground uh, far more often uh, to, wi to win a free if they can at all, because it's such a big advantage now. And the rules are in their favour to do that now. And we haven't seen it yet, but we will definitely see it. You know, a corner forward or a full forward in particular, buying a penalty and buying a sin bin 
by, you know, even getting tangled up with the cornerback. The cornerback's going to be the one that gets the blame. It's a cynical tackle. He's going to the bin for 10 minutes, and it's a penalty, and it's game-changing moments. So, yeah, uh, it's just, it's just we're, we're almost getting tongue-tied and, you know, wrapping ourselves up in all these different rules now when I don't think there's a need. And as I said, I think there's there's some people um, that have been, have been making a concerted effort to try and change Hurling and to try and, you know, have you know on a par with football is regards rules and i do not agree with it in one bit they are two completely different games they cannot be officiated and refereed and the rules cannot be the same as football they are completely different games just like the rules for football cannot be the same for hurling on the on the counterpoint they're different games completely and are, are we better off highlighting when people dive and just you know naming and shaming because one thing in hurling you don't want to be called is windy and you know even diving is, is almost like an extension of it but at the same time you're you're talking about amateur players and you kind of you know it feels harsh at times if you go after them but the, like when it does happen like last year the the under 20 football all ireland there was a massive dive at the end of the game i felt and i called it out on twitter and you get a massive backlash so if we start calling out players who, like John Kiley didn't name players, but he goes, when a player has the ball and they run at you and throw themselves on the ground and they're roaring and shouting, that's embarrassing and that's not part of the game. Simulation, yeah, some clear examples. A couple were very embarrassing. None of us want to see that brought in as part of our game, you know. Obviously not. So what's the solution? Call it out, name and shame? I tell you what, uh, there was a bit of needle between Limerick and Galway yesterday and there's probably been a bit of needle between them anyway. But like, do you think those comments aren't going to be taken with and ran with for the for the summer? I personally, I I love it because because it's great. It Tim calling out what he believes in, regardless of whether it's true or not. But it just increases the needle between the two of them. I do. I pro I, I probably agree with you, Shane. Yeah, probably we probably do need to name and Shane. There's not the worse. Uh, there's not the worse than as you say, been tired with that brush, have been windy or been a diver or something like that. Uh, and I like the last thing anybody wants is for us to be talking about, oh, did he dive or did he not? Like you're talking about in soccer now, and it's just it's it's painful, really. And you know, to, in my head, I don't watch much soccer, but in my head, I would you know see and this rightly or wrongly, people can call me out, and I'm probably wrong on it, but rightly or wrongly, I see a lot of, a lot of footballers as divers as cheats that they're just looking for what they can get because the rules are now in their favour. Um, and we're turning hurling into that, and I don't like it one bit. Yeah, yeah. Like there are players who go down easy, and uh, I'm sure we'll get plenty of comments in on that. I, I do feel a little bit uncomfortable, like one, uh, talking about naming and shaming specific players. But I have mentioned a Galway defender before for this, and quite a backlash for it. And you've got a couple of people that that you'd nearly name as well. And like, do people even think that we should? That you should be naming and shaming. Like, uh, I I wouldn't say I wouldn't say so to be honest with you because it's a because it's an amateur game and obviously they're not getting paid for it or whatever and they're not pretend like they're there to be shot at enough by putting themselves into that kind of profile putting themselves into that light of being an inter county player um like for example uh like I actually think this is a bit disgusting really uh, I saw every time Bernard Power plays for the Galway Footballers people comment about his weight or his body shape and i think it's absolutely awful it's brutal and he's a brilliant goalie and people are all of a sudden you see people on twitter saying oh he wintered well and this kind of stuff i think it's disgusting so i don't know i'm not sure about actually naming and shaming someone over something like that but maybe it's the sort of thing where it needs to be highlighted on the sunday game or something like that you're not vilifying somebody you're just showing you know no maybe someone that did something in in not a great light personal attacks not so much. Like, remember that personal attack on, let's say, Austin Gleeson a couple of years ago. I, I don't, I don't agree with that. But it does need to be highlighted to, uh, to some extent too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's let's talk about the game itself. Galway beat Limerick by twenty six points to one seventeen. Evan Nyland obviously on fire with the freeze, and David Reedy knocked over a good few for Limerick as well. Galway were, I, they had Limerick at arm's length for a lot of this game. Um, you know, there was obviously opportunities for Limerick to come back and win the game too. They had it back to just a couple of points at different periods. But I think for the hurling world, it's important to, for us to be able to see that Limerick can be beaten. And, you know, there was a couple of things that stood out from the game. 
Limerick did get their scores from throw-ins in, in both halves. I thought that was kind of interesting that they are able to do that. Kilkenny used to do that for years, that they'd win the throw-in and have a score on the board almost straight away. So really had a free at the start of the game after Brian O'Grady won a free. And uh, Groot Hegarty, who was, who was exceptional again, he scored after a flick from uh, Dara O'Donovan. So uh, it's the first loss since July 2019 in a competitive game for Limerick. Do you think it's important for the world of Hurland to see that? I think it's important for Hurland to see that, that Limerick are beatable. I think it's important for Galway to see that they can beat this Limerick side and beat them, as you say, comfortable enough. I obviously had Limerick as, as one of my locks of the week. Mayo came up as the other part of it. Did I ever uh, really think that Limerick were going to win the game? No, they never really threatened the goal too much. Uh, I think physically, like Limerick weren't able to get away from Galway. They, they weren't able to just burn them off at any stage. And I think at times they thought they would be able to, to do that and burn them off. And even Garrod Hegarty run down the pitch. He wasn't, get, he wasn't getting away from guys, maybe well, like he was last I, year. I don't know if I agree with that. He got away from Adrian Tui and I, I think Finton Burke at different times. I, I thought he was a danger. I did think that they were struggling to keep tabs on him. He was he was a danger, but I, I, like he didn't get the, he wasn't able to get the shot away himself. Yeah, shall, okay. shall we say? Do you know what I mean? That's kind of they were still able to get that get that kind of pressure on. Um, I talk I talk all we were I, like talk all we were. You know, they got a lot. Of, they got a lot of matchups right. They got a lot of physical matchups right. Uh, I think they were brilliant with brilliant with the ball. Far far better with the ball than Limerick were at times. Limerick were at times going long. And the ball going in was a 50-50 ball. It wasn't that 60-40 ball. When they got a couple of decent ball, a decent, a decent ball or two into Galan or a decent ball into Flanagan, uh, they looked they look dangerous. Uh, but I think I think from a Galway point of view, I think they'd be delighted. It was a lot more it was a lot more positive. Uh, the tactics were a lot more positive than the All Ireland semi final last year. They went to win the game, not to stay in the game. And it was interesting to see Joe Canning come on at midfield of all places, and you can kind of see some merit with. Him to it because he's a ball player he can carry the ball as he did for when he set up that brilliant score for Cahill Mannion who sort of wheeling away from goal about 40 yards out towards the sideline knocked it over beautifully that was a moment of magic and he can produce those and we talked about him going off early in the All-Ireland semi-final last year but Canning at midfield you can see him being a ball player being able to put the ball exactly where the forward would want it but then again, I'm not sh- like, is this something that Shane O'Neill is, is particularly considering? And by the way, actually, just when we go back to the simulation talk, which I'm not referring to a canning, of course, but John Kiley is a Limerick man and, pr- and previously was on the panel of Limerick with Shane O'Neill. So Shane O'Neill won't take too kindly to those comments, surely. But uh, it, No, I love that. It's needle between two Limerick men as well. Yeah, but uh, back to the whole Joe Canning point. Do you see this as being something that could happen a bit more regularly or is it just, you know, the way sometimes you see a player... He's just back, probably hasn't had much game time. Throw him out where he's going to have to cover an awful lot of ground. Just make him get that bit more of a blowout, blow out the dirty petrol. Uh, potentially, I see it as something that they could look at. Uh, when Portumna won their last club all Ireland, he was out at midfield, mm. having obviously started at maybe corner forward for the first one, full forward. He might have been even out in the half line. Um, like Different managers, different teams have been quite good at reinventing him some, somewhat. Uh, the half forward role nowadays, the amount of ground you have to cover is can be, you know, it's very, very taxing on the body. And a lot of the time you're going up and down the line and maybe you're not having as much, uh, maybe you're not having as much of an influence on the scoreboard from play and even uh, setting up attacks from your own team because you're just getting through a lot of work at different stages. Out around the middle of the field, you can conduct things a little bit more. Uh, so like, I think, I think they'll think if they can get him on a lot of ball around midfield, he'll punish people from play. And he'd, he'd, his ball into the forward line is brilliant as well. I think, interestingly, though, will be, you know, he, obviously not many would have expected him to come on midfield yesterday and Limerick probably weren't necessarily ready for him. You know, if he plays a couple of games midfield, all of a sudden then do, does a team, I'm not saying he's slow or anything like that, but does a team put a runner on him and try and put him on the back foot, try and make him defend more than attack? Is that so like I think Noel that... McGrath then going to midfield for Tipperary and like he was brilliant and arguably could have been hurler of the year in 2019 in midfield, but then the likes of Tim O'Mahony, his pace running at you is a very difficult proposition. Or, you know, let's say it was Dara Fitzgibbon or something like that. So that it could, you, you just need to make sure that if you're going to have a ball player who isn't necessarily lightning at midfield, that they, they're not left isolated on a road runner. Yeah, it's, di- it's difficult. Uh, do I see, you know... A Galway midfield partnership of David Burke and Joe Canning in championship. I'm not sure because I'm not sure if they'll be able to cover the ground of, you know, if you put a Johnny Cohn in there, 
he's he will be an energizer bunny up and down the pitch. He mightn't necessarily score, but he'll get through an awful lot of work, which will allow Canning to flourish. Burke is more of a ball player as well. So I, I don't know if you can afford to have two ball players in midfield. And it was great to see David Burke back to his best gesture. I know, I think he picked up a little minor kind of a hamstring injury, which will probably see him out for a couple of weeks now. But he was, you know, that kind of real energetic force yesterday, getting forward, put over. That was like, a, you know, a trademark David Burke point that yeah. he got yesterday, you know, that we saw in 17 and 18. And if he's back to that sort of form, he's kind of, he's kind of chasing his tail last year, uh, chasing fitness. If he's can be if he can be back to something like his best, he's a big asset. It's going to be interesting to see. But the thing is as well, you know, Canning could be centre forward when we see him next. We we don't know, but I'm sure they'll keep teams guessing. And as I say, he can take advantage uh, of a lot of that extra space. As I said, midfield is the only line in the pitch that only has two guys in it. So technically, there should be more room there for a guy like him to to manoeuvre. Yeah, I wonder it was part of John Kiley's comments yesterday, born of frustration at his own team's performance. Well, in that, maybe he thought those things, but maybe he mightn't have said them if he didn't come in a little bit sore about how his team had played. I mean, they did lose by six points. They put up 117, which seems really low for a team that last year at times was putting up 30 scores in games or, or not too far off it. They are a free score inside. Now, he, tr- he tried out a few players, but it, you know, Cahill uh, O'Neill played uh, corner forward. Prob- like you can see, he looks good. The end product wasn't quite there. Brian O'Grady played in midfield, started off well. Maybe didn't fully get into it, but you can see, you know there's more to come from the, from those players. Other lads like Peter Casey, who's been in and out of the team the last few years, he was good. He troubled his markers at times. Seamus Flanagan continues to to look good at full forward. Scored a nice goal after he'd been set up by Groot Hegarty. Um, but McInerney also, did well enough on him too, though. He did. Like, yeah, like you can't blame McInerney yeah. for that goal. You know, when someone hands the ball into your man, he's standing on his own. And you, you have to go to the, the attacking player so you, you, or the, the guy who's coming through with the ball. So you can't blame him. So do you think that he... Like, fullback is the toughest position in Hurling in terms of, like, you're left isolated on probably the best player and there's good ball probably going in. So it's athletically very demanding. Dahi Burke is the best fullback in the country, but he'd probably be their best wingback. And what a half-back line if you had Finton Burke, Park Mannion and Dahi Burke. That would help you win the game. But having Dahi Burke fullback would give you a fair chance of stopping the other team winning the game. So what do people think is better? Having Dahi Burke full-back or in the half-back line? I go half-back line, take my chances with Garod McInerney at full-back because he's a big man. He hasn't been ex- exposed at full-back yet for my money. And um, I, I think he can do a job back there. And Dahi Burke, I just think he's he would drive the team forward. And you'd have a fair toss-up between half-back lines than between Limerick and Galway, who's is better. Yeah, I think I think I agree with you about Mac and Ernie. Uh, I think you know what you're going to get from a fullback. Everybody's going to be, you know, exposed at different stages. That's just the, the nature of it. I think Shane Kingston gave him a bit of bother last year, mm. but that's more to do with it's more to do with the space that's in front of him. And if you have a dominant half back line, uh, technically you're probably going to reduce the amount of good ball that's going into that full forward line. So uh, just on Kylie, um, you partly are saying that Kylie is the great deflector. And he might and he might be deflecting from a what was a you know a pretty comprehensive. It was a six point. I wouldn't say it was a hammering, but they they never Limerick never really looked like like winning the game. And potentially he's deflecting away from that. Uh, he's not going to you know he probably has maybe some reservations about some performances of his players yesterday and the performance of the team as a whole. Um, I'm sure he was he was obviously interviewed just after the game. He was probably uh, a bit boiling over the fact that they'd been beaten. And a bit boiling over, you could see a couple of calls that were borderline. It looked like yesterday, every day, every time a Limerick guy went to tackle, uh, there was going to be a free. But we caught, we talked about that last year. Um, their their tackling is on the borderline. It is really, really on the borderline. And they they how should I say it? They offered the opportunity for the referee to make a decision a lot of the time. And if there, you know, if if that's the way the game is going and it's been sanitized a bit more, the referee is going to lean towards giving a free, and he definitely did that yesterday. So Limerick probably have to need to take a look at themselves as well. They're probably been overly robust with throwing hurls in around lads, swarming lads with hands as well. 
So that's probably something they're going to have to look at. They, they gave away huge free counts at different stages last year. Waterford got back into the Munster final as a result of the free count at the start of the second half. So that's probably something, while he did probably deflect there, that's something that they're going to have to look at. Interesting comment from Alan Clancy and a, a fair point. I'd like someone to analyse the freeze given yesterday and provide evidence of where a Galway player dived which is a fair point too. Uh, Stephen Loftus, a lot of improvement still to come for Galway with Dottie Burke to come back, as well as Conor Cooney and Aidan Hart, Joe to get more minutes as well. And just back on what we were saying about the the Alison Becker moment, uh, Damien Fitzhenry coming up to take a penalty in the final minute of the 2001 quarterfinal versus Limerick was behind the goal in Croker. Brilliant. That's something you never forget. There was another really good one, yeah, actually. 2007 uh, as well. Just give us Damien, one second. Damien Fitzhenry da- against Tiff in 2007 was a fair six. I was behind the goal for that one. <laughs> David Benson, uh, this was brilliant. Uh, Rory McCarthy v Cork in 2003 in the first semi-final tight game. Real finish. And I remember Mitch Jordan gave him the pass. It was That was epic. Last puck of the game to, to snatch a draw. That was brilliant. Yeah, it certainly was. I'm looking over some of the frees that Galway got yesterday. And yeah, I can't remember too many of them that I was overly annoyed with at the time. <clears throat> you, you know, teams that are successful always play on the edge. And I, the art of the half foul where... Let's say I'm coming along with the ball, that you'll sort of half slap my arm down or half pull, half tug, whereby the crowd would go nuts if a free was given, but you have actually impeded the player and slowed him up for maybe a half second. And in a game of inches, that's obviously going to be enough in many occasions to, to dispossess somebody. So is it the case that they're just doing what successful teams always do, but maybe they're bigger and more physical, so it's more pronounced? A bit like why Aidan O'Shea doesn't get the freeze and probably has frees given away from him because he's so big compared to other players. Yeah, it's a fa- it's a fair point. Like if you look at Grode Hegarty, uh, even like so Seamus Flanagan or these guys tackling, they usually tackle a player that's smaller than them, and it can become it can be it can look even over robust or they're get, they're coming from you know a six foot four and tackling a five foot ten inch frame. Then all of a sudden you're coming down on you're coming down on a guy. Yeah. You're not you know meeting a guy shoulder to shoulder to a six foot four as well. So that, that can get kind of messy, but it is something that they're going to have to look at. Like, like Limerick, all Ireland champions giving away, you know, 14 scorable frees, uh, 14 frees that were scored and a, and a couple more on top of that as well is, is just not good enough. So uh, it'll be interesting to see, like Jason Ford put over a huge amount of frees the week before. So I don't think it's a common denominator just with Limerick necessarily. It's just that their attacking is very, very robust. It's very, very on the line referees at the moment are seeing it on the far side of the line mm. so now whether whether they should be seeing it on the far side of the line is another story but they are so they're going to have to they're going to have to rectify it they're going to have to look at it. yeah and um... and Shane just quickly quickly I love the way the narrative can change so quickly you know Limerick coming into 2021 uh, unbeaten throughout 2012 and you know snatched a draw against uh, or got a draw against Tip oh, Limerick still unbeaten now all of a sudden it's yeah, John Kiley hasn't won a game since 2020. <laughs> you flipped that on his head nicely. Hey, Evan Nyland staying on the freeze I thought was interesting even when Joe Canning came on the field. Now, Canning took one from his own half and knocked it over, but the closer closer range ones, Nyland was very, very good on the freeze. And it was an interesting battle, uh, Nyland centre forward up against Kyle Hayes. Now, obviously, there'd have been a bit of switching throughout the game. But Kyle Hayes, that's two games in a row where there are times when you can see, yeah, this, this lad, he's got hurling, he's got mobility, he's absolute massive tank but I wouldn't say he's dominated either games teams would obviously be playing the ball away from him but maybe Shane O'Neill has stumbled upon something there putting a, a diminutive player who, who I mean it's going to be very hard for Kyle Hayes to even try to tackle Nyland without killing him or giving away a free yeah no 100% yeah Evan Nyland's probably about 5 foot 9 Kyle Hayes is I think 6 5 I think mm. you know so it's always going to be difficult and it's just that's we've talked about before how the role of the centre forward has changed like it's no longer, you know, the the Brendan Birmingham, you know, awfully 1980s, puck a ball down on top of him and go toe to toe with the centre back. You're now putting in an elusive centre forward who's going to float around. And they switched Connor Whelan in at different stages in the centre as well. They gave him, they gave Hayes lots of variety yesterday. And for a guy who has never really played centre back at senior inter county level, apart from maybe that second half against Kilkenny in 2019. It's smart, like you're not going to put like what like in. You're going to put a clever, smart player who's going to be a ball player. I thought Nyland got a good bit of joy uh, from play yesterday as well. Like you have to make a centre back think. Like Declan Hannum, would that would all be so well synchronised if Hannum was playing. But when you have a new guy coming in who played centre forward 
uh, who played centre forward for years and even started against centre forward last year, then he's wing back. He's all of a sudden he's coming into six. You have to try and make him feel uncomfortable. And I think I think the way Gaul is set up definitely did make him feel uncomfortable. We didn't see Hayes able to, you know, get the legs moving and gallop forward. He didn't get on many balls like that. They didn't allow him to, in fairness. Um so they posed a lot of questions on them and they got not saying they got a lot of joy, but like they nullified him as as an attacking threat as a half back. And didn't didn't let him on the ball much, and Nyland was able to orchestrate some attacks. So it was definitely job done in in uh, Galway's case. Yeah, and one of the great things we keep talking about Limerick is their flexibility and versatility. But Keane Lynch, who keeps been moved from midfield to centre forward, he had a very quiet game by his standards. Kyle Hayes, we just talked about there. Mike Casey, I'm not sure what the sto- situation is with him and wh- when and if he can come back in full back Dan Morris he was obviously full back so you just wonder at some stage will all this tweaking and moving players around will that um, you know because when you're out on a team you like to feel settled into your position but um, there's plenty more to talk about as regards uh, both of these teams and I'm sure they'll be there towards the latter end of the championship just wanted to talk about use of the ball and this is something that uh, Sean Flynn hurling analyst he put up on Twitter in the past he's at hurling talk one if you want to go and follow him it's the retention rates of the deliveries from each zone uh, across the field. Now this is the use of possession from the 2017, 2018 and 2019 championships and of course this is um, uh, you know on the back of that Tipperary against Cork game which people were uh, very upset with and how Tipperary sat back but Cork worked the ball time and again and even when it wasn't working out they continued to go short but if you deliver the ball from inside your own 45 you've only one in three chance of holding on to the ball then move up to that next zone to its 42 percent chance 58% chances you move up to zone three and between the two 65s you're looking at a 73% chance so really like you have a very good chance of delivering the ball almost three out of four balls from that midfield area delivered to somebody in an attacking area it's going to land with the right person it stands to reason why would you go 50-50 when you can have 73% yeah no it's a, it's a fair it's a fair point and like I remember like starting out say with Offaly around 2007 or that and you know if you've got a ball cornerback or anywhere out around there you like you hit it long that was just that was that was the net that was the nature of it if you look back at did, did you win did you win many of them probably not it's probably similar to the percentages that you're saying there whereas now uh possession is such a kind of prize commodity now like if I, I'd, I'd love I, I I must do it in a game just for the crack almost just strike just strike a ball long and see how many boys absolutely rip me for it because it's just it's not really al- it's not really allowed anymore um and because I suppose it's, as I said it's just it's, it's such an important important thing and you just have to hold on to it with your life so all of a sudden now I'm looking to pick a man in one of those other zones I'm looking to up the percentage and as you say get it to that 58 percent or get it to that 73 percent zone and then get it's a much shorter ball going into the forward but it should be theoretically and statistically it will show that it's a much more likely ball that he he's going to win so like I don't know what what you think like you would have played a bit of full back back in the day like you're it's a hand pass now or it's it's a little flick pass it's like when was the last time you opened your shoulders playing back there? You just you just don't really. Yeah, I, I remember a, a training match um, towards the tail end of last year and playing centre back in it, and looking up and and this is actually like I was frustrated watching Tipperary and the use of the ball at times that just either going for a shot from hundred yards or hitting a fifty fifty, which is obviously far less than a fifty fifty ball into the forward line and expecting John McGrath or Bubbles or whoever to win it. But um, I remember that training match and you are very much subject to the options that are put in front of you. So I would ideally like to do a cross-field ball that just maybe bounces just before the, the forward so they can turn and almost be ready to strike straight away. And sometimes you deliver them well, sometimes you don't. But sometimes you just have to blast it. If you look up and there's nothing on, and let's say the defenders that are marking your forward teammates, you're, they, they're always able to get in front of their man. Like, what do you do? Do you continue to hit a ball in that, you know, we don't have the pace in the forward line? Are you going to hit a ball for your corner forward to go out and try and chase when they're possibly not going to win it? Sometimes you kind of have to lamp it. So I wonder, let's say, for example, the Tipperary backs who's, who went long a lot and also against Limerick because good ball didn't go in. Is it because the options aren't there because Tipperary don't have the pace in attack or because they're focusing so much on what they're doing without the ball at the moment and they're, they're fr- they frustrated Limerick and Cork quite well Tip do lack pace. Let's let's be honest. You don't have that same burning pace. 
So they have to do something different. But when you isolate forwards that aren't lightning, then it's going to be difficult to score and set up attacks and give good ball in. I think the couple of good balls that they gave, gave into John McGrath, he was very good. Yeah, Jason uh, I don't, I don't, gave yeah. one beauty, and I think Alan Flynn early on gave him a nice ball. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I have no problem with that sort of long ball. If it's a, but if it's, if it's just, if it's right in on top of you, as you say, it's no good. It has to be out. You have to be able to move into space. Uh, whereas if it's in on top of you, it's not even a 50 50 ball, it's an 80 20 ball to the defender. The couple of good balls that they got into John McGrath where he was moving towards a ball, I actually thought were, were quite decent balls coming in. Uh, I do agree with you as well. Sometimes you do, I think, I still think sometimes you have to lamp a ball in the edge of the square. Anna Murphy hit free yesterday, right down on top of the six yard area. Niall Burke, brilliant catch despite three, guy, three guys been on him. Um, threw it out to Concanon, it was a goal chance, recycled, ended up with Connor Whelan, and it was a point. Like, sometimes you do have to leave it into the danger area. You're not going to score a goal unless you put it in that area. So there are still occasions when you that is still the the best tactic. And I think probably uh, why we would enjoy, like, even watching a junior hurling match or an intermediate hurling match is because it's going to be more old school like that. And you might have a big full forward, a birdie full forward who's uh, tasty on skills, not so tasty on speed. And you put a ball in around there and you'd be able to catch a ball and rattle it to the net. But I do think even at senior inter-county level, there is still, um, there's still an occasion for that. There are, times, there are times when he's outnumbered in there and it's, and it's a waste of time nearly hitting the ball in. But there are other times, particularly when there's not a lot, lot of defenders back, get it in there, give yourself a chance, try and make something happen. Yeah. Um, when I was analysing Cork, but you know, after the game at half time. I was looking at it, carrying the ball, swift hand passes, off the shoulder, interplay. Should have scored more in that first half. Jack O'Connor had a, had a wide early on when a goal was on. Uh, the athleticism of uh, Tim O'Mahony from midfield, like what a weapon he is. He played wing-back the week before against Waterford. Patrick Collins, his use of ball. Actually, this was such a, an interesting <clears throat> subplot to the whole thing. Patrick Collins was in goals for Cork with his brother, Ger Collins, as the sub-goalkeeper. Barry Hogan was in goals for Tipperary with his cousin Brian Hogan on the bench. So you had cousins against brothers uh, bet between the sticks. And I thought for Cork it was a good test of them because the conditions were so, were so poor, especially in that first half. And that's the question we'd ask. What would they be like on, the, on a rainy day when it was dirty and the team sat back and tried to frustrate them? Which Tip did at times. Like, I mean, we, we could hear uh, Tommy Dunn at one stage beckoning the Tipperary, Rona Maher, for example, to sit back and bring back the midfielders from the puckouts, which is the right thing to do because once you get drawn up the field against Cork and they've uh, space to hit the puckouts, you're going to get annihilated. So uh, I, it was a good test of Cork. And the reason I think that they came through with probably more than Tipperary in terms of positives, they, they drew, they only scored 216. That's not a huge tally to get 18 scores. But you can see where they're going and what they're trying to do with the ball. And the fact they're trying to work it around and they upset Tipperary with that. It broke down at times, absolutely. But it's only their second game back trying to do it. So give them another three or four games. Whereas Tipperary, I like how they stripped Cork of the ball at times. That they didn't leave themselves wide open. To me, that's a bit of an evolution. But the, ev the, the next stage of that has to be, what are we doing with the ball when we have it? To try and open up the opposition. Because that's the, that's the thing that wasn't quite happening here. Like From play, just five scoring chances created last week against Limerick. And just, you know, not enough created from play. Not enough times did they have Cork on the back foot inside the 45 here. So I still think Cork will come out of this with plenty of positives and feeling like we're moving in the right direction. Albeit with Robbie O'Flynn going off injured with a hamstring. You know, that that's a big blow and hopefully... He's on the long. goal, Shane. Sorry, I lost you there for a second, Shane. I was just saying, Tip haven't threatened the goal in two games. But we know uh, that Tip... That's one, that's one thing that they nearly always do. So I think what they're trying to do is uh, make sure that they're secure at the back, try and uh, upset other teams. They've set up basically, they set up differently against Limerick than they set up against Cork. They've set up to stifle the opposition. I think they're trying to get things right at the back first. And I think they know even that when Seamus Callan comes back and they know that they have the forwards to, to punish teams. I think they're just trying to get secure at the back first. The interesting thing, and you mentioned about pace with Tip, to me, there was definitely, uh, and it was obvious at times, that when Cor certain Cork players got on the ball and there was, uh, you know, you know, maybe a handful of Tip guys in front of them, guys maybe that weren't 
blessed with this unbelievable pace, but are unbelievably risky. The Cork guys were really, I think they made a point of actually going at them and taking them on and totally putting them on the back foot. So Tip have to find a balance between having these risky hurlers that can really hurt you on the scoreboard, but also having guys that can cover the ground that you need to cover now and that aren't a liability when they don't have the ball. That, you know, that a team, just like remember that Philly McMahon and the Gooch, not saying the Gooch was slow at the time, but he was put on the back foot and all of a sudden he was almost a bit of a liability for Kerry because Dublin were able to attack him like that. And I think some teams would start looking at some of the Tipperary attackers. If we can deny them as much possession as possible, then when we do get on the ball, uh, we're going to take them on. We're going to go at them. We're going to try and create overlaps and it maybe exploit that bit, bit of uh, the absence of pace that they have. So I think that's an interesting one. From a Cork point of view, uh, I think they'd be, they'd be disappointed that they didn't get a win the other night because it was a very, very winnable game, even though Tipperary hit an awful lot of wides. But to be, I think they'd be happy that they stuck to uh, what, they, what they were trying to work on in the first game. It was very obvious. At times, I, I, I would have been right in saying that you were fearful at times the other night. Fearful that you were going to be cut open. Fearful that there was going to be uh, an overlap. Fearful that there were going to be 20-yard passes to hand and it was going to be bang, bang. Like, like uh, Jack O'Connor's goal chance at the start. They were, he, they, Tip were so well cut apart by pace and slick passing. And that's a worrying thing for an opposition team. Because if you allow Cork to play like that and play on their terms, they can do so much damage. So I think you have two teams that are you know, in the evolution of their game plan. Cork kind of going a bit more exaggerated, looking for more goals, really chasing green flags. Tip trying to make sure that they're secure at the back. Like, I'll put it to you this way. When Tip play Galway, I don't see it resembling the, the championship game last year. I don't see them, you know, trying to beat them on the scoreboard in a big, you know, Brazil 9-8 game. I think they'll be trying to hold, hold what they can um, and not concede a lot of goals. So I think they're both kind of evolving and they're both probably at different stages at the moment. But it's it's just interesting. Tip, I think, tactically, are maybe have a bit more nous maybe than, than they had last year. Well, there, and that's good because there's no point in losing the same way. <clears throat> and that's always been my concern that, that it would end up going down that route. Um, I was fearful when Cork got the ball because the pace they have is is unbelievable. If they pull everything together... Cork can win in All-Ireland, if not this year, next year. I, I don't see any reason why they couldn't mount a big challenge for it. And if they don't this year, it'll more than likely be down to themselves. Maybe injuries will get in the way. Uh, just to come back to Tipperary then, looking at the spine of the team, right? W what, what are they trying to do here? So um, you have Barry Hogan in goals, and he looks very comfortable in possession. You know, in the same way that Patrick Collins looked really, really composed. He'd give a ball to a defender. He'd come back out around the 14, 21, didn't bother him. He'll move left and right. And I think it's so important to have a goalkeeper like that. The best teams generally do have them. I think Barry Hogan looks very comfortable moving around as well. Tipperary didn't work the ball as short quite the same way as, as Cork did. And maybe that isn't playing to their strengths. But so, you know, we'll move on. That's, that's just the way it panned out. Paddy Maher was full back on Patrick Horgan and Paddy Maher had a very good game I think you and I we were both there we agreed on that now he was marking Patrick Horgan who is probably the best hurler in Cork and arguably the best hurler in Ireland in terms of sweet touch and all that but he's probably the least pacey of those fours so if you're going to be isolated one-on-one -on -one for Paddy Maher that probably you know he, that gave him as good a chance as anything he's gonna he's gonna bully pretty much any player physically and pace wise that would that play to his strengths but i think Paddy maher gave a reminder that he's still got something there that he's 32 years of age but he's not gone yet but you, you do have to kind of look at it and think right liam sheedy's maybe going horses for courses there and that is what you're going to have to do because different oppositions uh, present different um hurdles every single day but Paddy maher did well there and there's no saying that he wouldn't have done just as well against somebody else. But uh, like Cork actually brought on Alan Connolly and he did quite well. And he started, uh, I think he snapped the ball inside. He won a free, like he was very good. Um, so then centre back, you had Seamus Kennedy started there. And then um, I think Rona Maher went in there eventually. Alan, Ty Alan, sorry, Alan Tynan was on the bench, the former rugby player. He came in. Dan McCormick was out. That was a big blow for Tipperary because obviously he showed against Limerick how important he is to the team. So midfield, you had Noel McGrath, who had a tough first half at times. He always produces some, some nice moments all the same. And he grew into the game. And you had Alan Flynn beside him, who, who's probably, like, he's a really good hurler, but it converted back. And then further up the field, Tipperary interchanged a nice bit. You had different people in different forward positions. John McGrath generally in full forward as well. 
And I just don't, it's hard to know if Tipperary have settled just yet. I don't think Tipperary know what their, what their team is going to be come championship. But you can see, like, Brian McGrath comes into the team. He does well at sort of full, full back line, sort of corner back as well. But do you, do you feel like Tipperary have, have come close to settling on their team? Not really, to be honest with you. No, not really. Um, like, if you look at it uh, on Saturday evening, I think it was... Uh, pace and mobility wise was a completely different team that, than played against Limerick um, and Dan McCormick being out was obviously robbed them of a, a lot of a lot of energy as well so I think it's, it's a difficult one is kind of marrying that balance between having all the silky hurlers but also having guys that are going to be able to cover the ground that they're going to need to cover um, they're, they're, but they've, they've managed to be more tactically astute I would have said maybe than in, than in previous years and they've They've put out a team that they thought would do best against the opposition team, rather than just going with uh, what they, what they think their best fifteen is. You know, they've picked more horses for courses. So I think I think it's interesting. It'd be interesting to see how it evolves a bit more. As you said, Parik Martin has definitely put his hand up as well. Just on the Cork point of view, I just want to ask you quickly because it's just marvelling at him the other night. Um, like Mark Coleman, is there a better first touch in hurling than Mark Coleman? His ability to get the ball in hand so quickly is just absolutely outstanding. Yeah, Patrick Horgan wouldn't be too far off it. Bubbles? Yeah, Bubbles wouldn't be too far off too, yeah. Um, just, I, I just, I think it's unreal when ball is around feet, just how quick he gets the ball in his hand. He must have touched the ball 50 times the other night. Yeah, and you can understand why Cork could try and build a team around him. So it doesn't matter what situation he's in, he's going to be comfortable with the ball. He'll pirouette one way, he'll flick it another. Like, what, what a weapon he's produ- uh, pro- um had become and that Cork backline they've all got mobility and pace like Robert Downey played wing back he's played full back uh, Owen Cadigan came in wing back he's played full back Colm Splann has come back in they've three or four good corner backs to pick from they have an awful lot of what you want uh, Luke Mead in the half forward I think he's underrated again his role in that goal I think Tipperary just spilled possession I think Jake Morris had a little bit of a loose hand pass towards Cahill Barrett it allowed um, it allowed Cork to dispossess them, and Luke Mead went through. He was very good against Waterford and helped set up some of those goal chances, or certainly was involved in them. And then Patrick Horgan finished it lovely. But, but Cork seemed to have they just have a team that seems to make more sense than in the past, and players playing with each other rather than everyone looking to tap over their score. Like they could have got more goals here after getting five against Waterford. There's something different. There definitely is. There's uh, there's a killer instinct to them now. And I think you, you and me could both hear it on the sideline when a couple of guys maybe took shots that were uh, lower percentage shots or that were maybe seen as the handy option. I think Cork are trying to eliminate that handy option and they're trying to go for your throat. And that's different uh, for, uh, for a defence. That's a small bit terrifying, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll uh, get your comments in on Tipperary against Cork. That was a draw, two draws in a row for Tipperary, whereas Cork have three points from two games. Watford saw off Westmead 120, 122 to 119. Bit of a backlash from Westmead. They had lost by 30 points to Galway. There was a huge amount of changes from Watford. I think something in the line of uh, 12 or 13 changes here. So they probably felt like they were going to win this game no matter what. But m- made hard work for it, or more so Shane O'Brien's team. They stepped up and kind of laid down a marker after a very ropey opening to the league. Your club mate Shane O'Neill may, may have taken, uh, may, may have been a backlash. Your cooler club mate uh, may have taken. It may have been a backlash to some of the comments we made last week. I don't. We weren't uh, trying to be disingenuous or anything like that. I just couldn't see Westmead winning a game in Division One. And to be honest with you, I didn't. I didn't see them being as competitive as they were at the weekend. So it was obviously, obviously a very, very good show. And uh, as you say, uh, Watford probably used it as a chance to get you know seventy minutes into a lot of other guys. Uh, run their panel a bit more, uh, try and see if they could find any new options maybe that they didn't have last year. Uh, there was probably an opportunity for guys there. Uh, I didn't see much I didn't see much of this game. I know you saw a good bit more of it. I don't know if many guys put their hands up, but in, in a given day when Stephen Bennett's not starting and when Desi Hutchinson says not starting and some of the big marquee forwards aren't starting, they're always going it's always going to be a bit tighter. Uh, it's always going to be a bit more difficult game. But were there any guys in particular, newcomers the likes of DJ Four and any of these guys put their hand up to be an option at some stage. Again, I, I saw very little of the game as well. I have to hold hands up on that. But 
I think Mikey Carney scored a nice goal at the start of the game. We saw DJ Foran scoring a nice one as well. Uh, the commentator actually on GA Go happened to mention the copycat. When, when Kieran Doyle was standing over free, he mentioned the copycat that myself and Nisha Waldron tried during the week. And we have another copycat coming during the week as well. We were down in Semple Stadium and we tried a classic old skill for somebody and had five attempts each. And keep an eye out for that because... Uh, God, we're two fairly tasty hurlers, aren't we? Uh, well, I tell you what, I, I'd imagine the first one you're going to put up is probably complimentary of yourself. I would think the two other ones are not so complimentary. Well, they'll never see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, let's move on to, obviously, good performance from Westmead, and we want to see them back that up. And I think uh, Waterford, to some degree, with all those changes, they are kind of uh, looking towards games a little bit further ahead I, I think you can say that and be you know be realistic about it and think you don't make 13 changes if you're and rest all your star players if you're not kind of thinking a little bit further down the line and that's just the way it is and it's not meant to be insulting towards Westmead we've always just a talked. couple of comments in Shane uh yeah. Will says I like militant Verney very much more than pacifist Verney he says the HRA the hurling reform army <laughs> um a couple of other interesting comments uh Mikey Clifford said John Kiley never mentioned simulation as re with regards to Dermot Burns. Um, uh, he said he helped to get a Clare player sent off in 2018. Not so sure if I, if, I, if I agree with that, but he said Limerick boy is well able to buy a free also. Like, and that has to be said as well. Like, if he's saying there's simulation on one side, like, every team buys a free at mm -hmm. some stage. Every team buys a free. That's just part of it, you know. Um, Martin Furlong just said the last 50 minutes yesterday was the best Wexford played. We'll move on to that since 2019. Considering the injuries Wexford had, it's hugely encouraging performance. Bring on the old enemy next week. Uh, and Un Agar, it's an unusual name, said, why wouldn't players die with all these cards and rules that has turned to crap? And, like, that's the problem, is you're encouraging that. And that's the last thing you want to encourage. I, I didn't think all the games this weekend were terrible. Like, uh, Galway and Limerick, I thought, was, was fairly interesting. The, the big problem with Waterford Westmead is there were 48 frees in it. I mean, that is a glorified free-taking competition. And that, when you think that there is 70 minutes in a game, obviously injury time as well, there's water breaks, there's no crowd. I mean, there's, there's all these things. It's very, very hard to keep, keep the interest level at home. I mean... I'll put it this way, when I'm watching soccer on telly at the moment, a couple of times I've turned it on without the crowd noise, and then after a second I'm like, why is this so terrible? Or turn on the fake crowd noise. I need to be, trick me please, make me, yeah. you know. So if you're sucking everything out of a game in soccer and it feels a little bit hollow, it's going to be the same in, in hurling. Like, you don't have that many frees per minute in soccer. You know, and, and obviously that's a slower moving game. Hurling and Gaelic football and stuff like that, it needs, it just needs to be let flow and Get rid of the water breaks. Donnick O'Donnell, actually, he sent in a comment as well. I'll just read it here. Extremely frustrating. Sorry, first of all, just to, to frame what I had said myself. As we can see with all water breaks, including here in Galway versus Limerick, it's also a tactics break. Little tweaks to game plans here often affect games. If it's a water break, maybe management teams shouldn't be letting your players during it keep game flowing. Thoughts? Donnick O'Donnell says, extremely frustrating. And now he is a coach. Can't get information on if you want a simple change, i.e. move a corner to wing. You can't go onto the pitch or sideline. You have to go down the sideline in the stand, try to call a near player and try to get him to communicate mid-game uh, mid to the far side. So that is very difficult too. He's coached with Lee Shane, like, mm. and he's experiencing the problems over the past two weeks. Interesting, uh, Parik Fanning replied to something I just said. I just put up a tweet yesterday and said, seriously worrying that hurling is becoming a non-contact game, which which I agree with. I don't, you can't hardly touch a lad now. He just said, uh, Parik Fanning, the ex-Waterford manager, current Dixborough manager, said, I'm actually going for a walk. Soon, seen enough for today, second week of league, and looking like this league will be eight weeks of hurling that will never be spoken of again. Very tame stuff. Hopefully, over the coming weeks, things will change and uh, we'll just go back to normal. When normal is great, why would you change normal? Yeah. And there's a man who absolutely loves hurling. So That's the thing, Shane. And if you're, if, you're, if you're pissing off guys like this, then you're, you're in bother. If you're, you know, if you're peeving lads that love hurling and just want to watch a good, good, honest match and forward and back, real interesting stuff, real fast flowing stuff, you're in a bit of trouble then. The, the one thing is there were a couple of good games. I enjoyed Galway and Limerick. It wasn't unbelievable. It wasn't setting the world alight. But teams are only back. It's only their second game back after so long away. I thought um, 
Tipperary and Cork was an interesting finale. Like, you know, Patrick Horgan had that shot from the sideline, hit the post, then Ronan Mara tries one from 100 yards and it just drops wide. It was an exciting finish, but there was, there was no crowd there at all to lift it up. And I think at this stage, outdoors, there should be ways to get some sort of a crowd in. But anyway, we'll leave that for another day. Wexford Clare was very good. Again, what would that have like, been like with a crowd? Kilkenny Antrim, that was, that was a very interesting game. I enjoyed watching that as well and seeing Antrim put up such a great showing two weeks in a row. And now I'm starting to think, right, can they start really building on this? And this isn't just going to be any sort of a flash in the pan. It always looked like they were moving in the right direction. But now, now you're like, wow, there's real substance to this. But um, I'll just jump into Dublin Leash. Donald Burke was an absolute fire with the freeze. And I watched, um, I got through the first half, so many games on, you know, like they're all on GEA go there at the moment. And a season pass is just 25 euros, which is unbelievable to be fair to them. But uh, Dublin actually started the game quite slowly. And I think Leash were like three or four, one ahead. And Paddy Purcell started brilliantly. And it seemed to have a big wind uh, in their favour. But Dublin did settle down and started to take over the game. Keen Boland looked uh, good in the parts I saw. Um, so like... That's for good for Dublin after losing at home to Kilkenny and fading away towards the latter end of the game. To put up 30 points here is no mean feat. No, it's a good bounce back in fairness. Yeah, as I said, it is all framed with the amount of freeze that were involved in it. Uh, far less free-flowing than, than we'd like it to be. Interesting that the word free-flowing has the word free in it as well, which is a mm. bit of a contradiction uh, in hurling terms. But uh, as I said, Shane, I mentioned to you on the Thursday show about uh, about comments that Humphrey Keller had made about about Dublin hurling. I just I'll go into them a bit more here now. His worries for the, for the future. Um, he just said he was talking about the hurling br- blueprint that was put together in in two thousand one. So that's 20, 20 years ago, and the the goal was to win an All Ireland. Uh, and you know, obviously, Cooler won Club All Ireland, and Dublin Colleges won a College All Ireland. But the the goal was to win a senior hurling All Ireland, and um, they're quite a bit away from that now. And he was just saying. The blueprint was trying to get more children to play hurling and it was very successful in doing that. Now the new blueprint is showing them how to play it right. While we have the numbers, we don't have the desire to strive for quality now. The sad part about it is that there's a huge amount of potential. Potential is huge and we want children to be out there playing. The standards simply aren't there when you compare to hurling big, hurling's big powers though. This is not this year or last year. This is going for on for the last 30 or 40 years. We- a lot of which has been, uh, in a lot of which has been implemented. By the way, but the big thing was to win All Ireland, and the prevention of that is still within the structure. So he has serious worries about um, not the quantity of players that are playing, but the quality. And he doesn't think that the games promotion officers are been given enough time to actually focus on quality, and it's more about getting sessions done and organising different bits and pieces. So uh, just a genuine worry from a genuine hurling man who's given, you know, the last, since he moved up to Dublin, he's given his he's given his life to, to Dublin hurling in various guises, be it, be it the, the hurling blueprint or Dublin managing Dublin or managing Nave Marnog or various other clubs in Dublin. But that is a worry from guys that really have their finger on the pulse in Dublin hurling, just about the quality of what's coming through and that they're not... Prepare. It's the opposite. He feels it's the opposite of the senior football. He feels Dublin, uh, Dublin are developing players the whole way through. When they get to senior football level, they're there. They're ready to be at that level. But he feels while we're while they're good at minor and under twenty, there's a massive, there's a like a big gaping hole between these guys going from under twenty to senior. Um, and Dublin have a lot of guys, and we've talked about this before. Have a lot of guys on their senior panel that are very very similar skill wise there's no you know, there's no real outstanding you know forwards as we said before there's no real guys that are going to shoot the lights out donald burke obviously is a is probably a, a ray of light there but just just a an interesting kind of little kind of uh aside maybe to to the weekend's match yeah but there is great work going on in clubs that's such a cliche thing to say but there are a lot of young players like at different academies and different clubs and some clubs maybe have massive numbers and other clubs have small numbers and I wonder like sometimes should there be a redistribution or more clubs should they pop up in different areas start off at underage let's say some of the really heavily populated areas of the city um, that maybe an extra club or two could be set up in those areas and not to pull people from the senior club because you know once you've established yourself in a club you're always going to stay in that club but if a couple of underage clubs were started in different parts of the city and that they move up and ultimately in 20 years time then you've got like a senior team you know that no that doesn't currently exist so maybe rather than 
having 50 or 70 or 80 young lads at one age group in one club and how many of those will stay playing because only 15 will start okay they'll have a second team and maybe a third team and maybe even a fourth team who knows but you might have a drop off rate because some young lads will feel like right I'm on the fourth team I'm just going to stick to another sport or I'm not going to bother or I don't get exposure to training with the top player or whatever it might be so more clubs may be the right thing or maybe concentrate on the clubs that are doing it right and make sure your young lad is going through that or your, your young girl or whatever it might be. So it's a tough one, but there are a lot of people uh, playing hurling in the capital and there are a lot of pre pretty good players. But again, it just comes back to the whole thing of the very best players are going for the um, the other code. And that's probably yeah. not going to a, a big thing Humphrey even said there, he said, why is Kieran Kilkenny playing football? Or why he said the best hur hurler Dublin have produced in the last five years is Conor Callaghan. And he, he basically said here that he just doesn't think that they see uh, the same structures in Dublin hurling. They don't see the same maybe ambition. He he, he called out the, the Dublin County Board as well and he's had he's had conversations with um he's had conversations with John Costello and, and others, but he just feels that there's not a desire there to really go after a hurling all Ireland in Dublin. That there, his, his comments, not mine. He just said Dublin are not prepared to be rootless in the quest for the all Ireland. We've been skimming around the edges, but not getting into where the issues are. And that's why within the coaching standards from under sixes all the way up. Um, while we might be doing well at underage, by God, is there a big difference to make that step up to senior? Why isn't Kieran Kilkenny playing hurling? Because he knows damn well that the, uh, well that the systems in place are not good enough to win all Irelands. So it is an it, I think it is an interesting one. Uh, people are always going to choose Dublin football at the moment if it's fifty fifty or even if it's sixty forty, uh, just because of the structures and maybe the 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 likelihood of success in that area. But uh, if it'd be interesting if you put down like if you had Karma Costello, if you had Kieran Kilkenny, if you had Con O'Callaghan, if you had you know a lot of these guys. Uh, Eric Lowndes, I think, as well, even played minor for Dublin. There's a lot of guys there. But that's not taken away from, from Dublin at the moment. Listen, they got back on the horse. They needed to get back on the horse after last weekend. And, uh, yeah, they, they probably did what you expected them to do. Yeah, and if they can pull it together with the players that they have, like Ronan Hayes has, has, has great talent. Eamon Trollier, Dylan, Keen Boland, I've often talked about him. Um, Danny Sutcliffe, if he can keep his... Like, we've seen signs of his very best form. So if he can keep improving on that... Chris Crummy, if he settles more and more into the forward line, we've always talked about how good the backs are and if the midfield can settle down. Um, th there's, plen there's plenty of decent hurlers in there, no doubt about it, and they'll die with their boots on. And that's something I've always said about the Dublin players. And Leash put up a score of 119 after scoring just 10 points the week before against Wexford. So that's certainly moving in the right direction as well. We'll jump on to the, uh, the Kilkenny against Antrim game. So I wanted to put Alan Murphy into my fantasy uh, fantasy team, but you're only allowed a certain amount of transfers. And, you know, like all these managers are turning their teams upside down week on week. So I think I had a couple of lads starting, like Caleb Lines, who was suspended, because I, I couldn't do enough changes to make sure that all of my players were starting. But I had Aidan McCarthy um, picked in my backs. He played in the forward line, so apparently he's after putting up an unbelievable score for me. Uh, but just to go Congratulations, to I'm delighted for you. Yeah, I'm feeling good about it. So Kilkenny beat Antrim 128 to 315. But Kilkenny had gone something like eight points ahead. Antrim brought it back level. There was a couple of nice goals in there, including one from Neil McManus. And then ultimately they pulled away also. But Antrim didn't go away. This is impressive stuff from Antrim. Yeah, no, in fairness, yeah, they, they didn't back it up with a win. But uh, a Kilkenny team that got off to a good start and looked like they were going to win and have Antrim at arm's length. They, they, they kept plugging away and by all accounts, just chatting to some Kilkenny folk, they were worried about the Antrim attack. They were worried about their ability to, to breach the line. They obviously had a penalty a penalty saved as well. Um, they were dangerous, caused the Kilkenny full back line a lot, a lot of trouble and their their ball handling probably wasn't as slick, their, their sharp passing probably wasn't as slick as it was against Clare. But it's definitely, it's like they would have wanted a win, don't get me wrong. And I think... Uh, Chris Kerr, the, the former Antrim footballer, just replied to a comment I had up when TJ Reid wasn't starting that they saw it as a big opportunity. And it was a big opportunity. But at least they, uh, they they got things maybe their own way up in Corrigan Park the week before. Things didn't go their own way, but they still stayed at it and were kind of defiant and you know stayed fighting despite maybe some of their better players um, being a bit more quiet than they were a week before. So definitely um, some more kind of green shoots up in Antrim. Um, from a Kilkenny point of view, uh, thought Darren Brennan was brilliant even though he conceded three thought he was very very good coming in for, for Owen Murphy interesting to see that Cody kind of shuffled the deck a bit I think TJ has a bit of a groin, a groin injury 
Um, so they put they they rested him. Um, it's kind of like what a difference a week makes for Adrian Mullen. Three points at the weekend. Got seventy minutes under his belt. Got far more stuck in. Um, uh, a couple more. Mossy Kion was obviously a bit quiet. A bit quieter. Um, Park Walsh was brilliant again. Brilliant again. Like really, really good at the, at the heart of their defence. So they had plenty of players that stood up, and as you said, Alan Murphy, um, Alan Murphy was decent as well, uh, even if he didn't get him into your fantasy team. But they they had lots of they had lots of kind of even kind of newcomers there that that showed well. Um, James Bergen in the corner as well has really taken his chance. Yeah, really, he, he, really, he, really, he, really taken his chance. He was pretty good against Dublin, and then he scored four points in this game as well. And he like he's a small diminutive player, but he rose up one stage and caught a nice high ball, turned and knocked it over the bar. Yeah, he was good. Massey Cohen, like he wasn't quite as impactful as he was against Dublin when he scored. Was it one three or one four or something like that? He got two points here. But the the Kilkenny defence, right, and midfield. And we talked about this, that they have a, an abundance of half-backs. If you go through the, the back line, like Tommy Walsh, he's obviously played in the full back line any time I've seen him, and even for Tullerone, full back. Hugh Lawler, he was midfield, actually, on the under-21 team that got to the All-Ireland Final in 2017, I think it was, against Limerick. Paddy Deegan plays centre-back for O'Loughlin Gales. And I like he played in the corner here but and has done for Kilkenny in the past, but I'd see him more as a half-back. David Blanchfield, he played wing-back, and you would see him there. Park Walsh, of course, the same. Connor Brown... He's uh, a half-back a lot. Now, sometimes he plays centre-forward for the club. Richie Reid and Killian Buckley midfield. You'd see them both as half-backs as well. So there's a, this is something that where I think Brian Cody's having to shuffle his deck a nice bit, a bit like Tipperary, and try and see how can I organise these players best to try and get the most fluent outfit. I don't think they look unbelievably fluent at the moment. And I'd, I'd imagine most Kilkenny people expected them to win this game by a little bit more or not have Antrim coming back and bringing it level in the second half. Yeah, there was talk. You know, there was a bit of talk down in Kilkenny that Kilkenny minus ten was um was a good bet. I wouldn't have seen that beforehand myself, especially with the changes that they made. Basically, Colin Fenley's gone for the year. No TJ, no Richie Hogan, no Walter Walsh. So you'd imagine that their attack would be blunt. They still put up a a, a big score, and they're definitely guys. Owen Cody was much better, having hit four or five wides the week before. He was much better, as I said. James Bergen was much better. Connor Brown, one guy you mentioned there, is a guy that's really coming into it. I think wing back, and he's an attacking wing back, and a guy that's able to score, particularly off off his left, but. As you say, they're trying to put uh, they're trying to put a lot of round pegs into square holes. They're trying to fit, you know, a lot of guys who want to play five, six, or seven, and you're trying to play them two, four, eight, nine. You know what I mean? It's 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 tricky enough, and we still don't really know. We still don't really know what way their backs are going to be. You know, there's a, a bit of worry in Kilkenny as well. Like, a feeling that Park Walsh might need to go back into the full back line. I'm not sure. I think you're I think you're robbing Peter to pay Paul there again. I just think he offers so much. Um, so much at the half back line with his uh, under high ball, his distribution and his ability to score as well. But as we said, we're still not exactly sure what way they're shaping up. But to be fair, and like it is the second, is the second round of the league. We're probably not supposed to really know yet. Yeah, yeah, and uh, James McNaughton was brilliant at centre forward. I know you said Park Walsh was very good, but some of the scores he got, he got four from play and added a couple of frees to it as well. I thought he was really good. Conal Cunning, the way he finished the goal was brilliant. Kieran Clark as well. I think he scored something like 1-3. So a lot of good stuff in that Antrim team. Very nicely finished goal from Neil McManus in the second half. And there's good pace in the team. I think physically, they're probably some of their players aren't absolutely huge yet. And maybe some of the players are diminutive players and they're in good shape or that. But to compete with the very best teams, I mean, look at the size of Limerick. But I think Antrim, they're definitely making, they're making ground the whole time. And it is great to see it because Hurland needs as many teams as possible being competitive. We'll jump on to Wexford against uh, Clare. So 219 Wexford, Clare 121. I think that sending off for Liam Curry in the second half was was absolutely crucial to how this game turned out. It was the 40, oh, sorry, it was the 58th minute, at which point Wexford were 14 points to 118 behind. That allowed, um, well actually, it was actually six or eight points at that stage. It was 118 to 13 and the resulting three ended up bringing it back a point. But from then on, Wexford were just all over. They were just all over, Clare. They used the ball really well, as they hadn't in the 2019 All-Ireland semi-final against Tipperary when a man and a few points in front. And like Rory O'Connor, his form, there's a reason I have him as the image uh, that with the show this week, the thumbnail image that you'll see on YouTube there. He was absolutely brilliant. He set up that goal for, for Lee Chin, the second goals, with, with a slaloming solo run, something similar we saw against Leash last week. 
and he given like a secondary assist for the other goal for Simon Donoghue. So he was on fire. Lee Chin started off the game, well, he actually played really well from play the entire game. But his freeze, just three from seven in the first half, he ultimately was taken off the freeze. So it was a little, or else decided himself. So a little bit of a ropey day on the freeze, all right. And that's a recurring issue for Wexford. But it's, it, like, it's good for them and for Davy Fitz. Two wins on the bounce now. Yeah, it uh, looked more like a, a 2019 performance, didn't it? Full of energy. And again, you need your well, best players playing well. In the you, half, you yeah. Need Ro- yeah, you need Rory O'Connor, you know, bursting through like that. You need Lee Chin doing that as well. They look like, yeah, they look like there's an awful lot more energy to them. There's a lot more purpose to them. As you said, lessons learned from 2019 as well. They, you know, they just didn't just didn't play smartly when they had the extra man against Tip in the All Ireland semi final. They played very very smartly yesterday. In fairness, uh, from a, from a Clare point of view, Tony Kelly going off with what looked like a dead leg. They, you know, they'll need him back ASAP. But in fairness, in his absence, they did very well. In his absence, they put up put up a good score. If it hadn't been for the sending off, things maybe would have been a bit different. It would have been easier to hold out at least and stem the tide a bit if they'd had 15 on 15 they maybe would have been able to sit a man back in the hole and and not let their kind of line be breached as it was but w- because Wexford had the extra man and the style that they were able to play uh the possession kind of style it was a lot more kind of honed um from a clear point of view everything was so doom and gloom uh after the game in Corrigan Park last week like they, they were very very good for you know an hour it was, there was, you know, a lot of good positive signs. The sending off did turn the game. There's no point in saying any different from a extra point of view. Uh, it's another win. It's Davies, but Davies' first win against Lone um, in in three meetings. He's kind of, he's kind of got, uh, he's got kind of one back on him. Um, and I think from a Clare point of view, the glue, doom and gloom all around the Cat or Lone and different things that are going on in the county board. While it while it wasn't a win, it was an awful lot more promising. Yeah, I, I think Gabriel Quilligan is going to be relieved in goal. He made some mistakes against Antrim, but I think he, he had a good performance here uh, on the whole. Tony Kelly started out the game well, went off injured after 28 minutes, and it was at that point that Aidan McCarthy went from full forward out to further out the field, and then he, his performance really took off. Now, he scored that sin bin penalty just before half time. Joe O'Connor, he, he went into the bin for 10 minutes. Mark Rogers started on the inside line. He looks like an exciting youngster for Clare, so they'll want to see more of him. Shane O'Donnell wasn't even playing. Ryan Taylor didn't start. So they, they have options there. Ian Galvin, he started the game. Good to see him back. And D- Dermot Ryan. So there, there's a, he was good in the half-back line. So there are a lot of positives there. Davy Fitz, uh, Fitzgerald started midfield. He also did quite well. Now, last night um, on the Sunday game, Jackie Tyrrells felt that John Conlon, who started centre-back, and Aaron Shanahan, who caused an awful lot of bother here for Wexford, that they could play together in the full forward line. Now, generally, full forward lines are two-man inside lines. So if we're to take it just as that, could you see the two of those playing together and giving Claire whatever they need to be successful? Similar types of players, I would have said. Um, maybe taking sh- up similar spots. It's not like you're going to plonk them either side of the 14 and it'll work. Like, you do have one guy who's go- who wants to sit a little bit deeper and kind of run behind the other guy and sort of spark yeah. off him. If you have two yeah, guys doing the same usually, thing, it's an issue. Yeah, usually you'd have a smaller player, wouldn't you? A smaller, yeah. more mobile player, maybe with, with a bigger player. Or usually, when you're playing a two-man full forward line, you have two, you have two mobile players. Um, so it's a, I, I'm not sure if I can see the two of them. If I can see the two of them playing together. It's kind of a difficult one. Um, but like from Claire's point of view, you have hopefully Colin Galvin to come back. You have hopefully David McInerney to come back as well. So. That's, you know, that's, while the results maybe haven't gone their way, it's definitely anything but doom and gloom. Yeah, and, and like, I don't see it as a big disaster for Clare. They did lose the game. They have a couple of winnable games to come, but they performed really well, and it was a good, um, it was a good response to how they performed against Antrim, because they'd be very, very upset with themselves for that. But obviously that was a lot down to Antrim too. So we'll jump on, get any comments in, of course, and uh, we'll jump on to 2A. So Mead beat Wicklow 20 points to 11. Kildare hammered Donegal 4.29-14. Down saw off Carlo, which uh, not everyone would have seen that coming, 3.20-3.18. And your Offaly uh, put Kerry to the sword, 2.28-13 points. Yeah, a massive win in fairness. I know Shane Conway was missing for Kerry, but it was a massive win and it was kind of domination from start to finish in fairness. Uh, Liam Langton scored 1-6 from centre forward, absolutely ran the show. My own made own cattle, uh, got four points from play as well. Good goal from Jason Sampson too. Um, just really, just really impressive stuff. Like having been beaten by Kerry uh, to be relegated to the to the Christie Ring a couple of years ago, beaten by them last year in the league as well. 
Good that we turned the screw and turned the screw in sensational fashion. Big weekend for Offaly. It's not. It's been a while since football had a decent win as well. So good. A good good weekend all around there. Good weekend all around there. And uh, just in some of the other Division Two B, Mayo had a good strong win against Roscommon. Armagh two twenty one. Long. Her own 125, Monaghan 213, Damien Casey top scored, but I think 116. And CJ McGorty from St. Gauls, who won an All Ireland club football medal with uh, St. Gauls in Antrim. Uh, he started for Tyrone the other day. He's made the switch to And in the 3B clashes, then Cavan and Fermanagh was level 119 to 216, and Loud beat Leitrim by a point. So it was great to have a full round of, uh, full round of hurling this weekend. Um, it mightn't have been exactly as, as we wanted maybe with some of the rules and some of the games but uh, it was still great to have it all back and while we do put, point out like some of the negative things of the weekend there was, there was lots of positives from the weekend too yeah absolutely so that's it that's the Hurling Show brought to you by OrgaRetro.com if you want to get 15% off this jersey or that jersey that Michael Verney is winning not to mention all the other ones in our catalogue use the promo code OrgaGame thanks very much Michael cheers Shane.